One last job. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm out of the game. Sorry, I dragged you back in. Take me back to the place I know with the mystery shack and the forest gnomes. I'm already back, so come on, let's go. Don't get me started. My heart's in gravity falls. Welcome to Mystery Shack Look Back, a nostalgic time capsule and no spoiler book club of the original Gravity Falls fandom, except not really doing that today. We are your curators. I'm Ella. I'm Shelby. I'm Charlie. And when we say see you next summer, we mean it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we we can see you, but you can't see us. Audio audio medium. Earlier we could see <laughs> Rob Ranzetti, but but uh, he couldn't see us. I ran away in shame from my camera. Which is to say, we are joined today once again by Robert Renzabert. <laughs> you who you may know as uh, Bobby Renzabi, of course. Yes. Or the author of the journal. The author of the journal. Yes. Rob Renzetti, yeah. True. I have uh, several nom de plumes. Nom de plumes, <laughs> including uh, creator of My Life as a Teenage Robot, uh, and of course, uh, what was that show we talked about before? Oh, I can't um, remember. My Little Pony, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. this podcast is <laughs> about. That's the thing we had a podcast about. Could be Samurai Jack. You worked on, I think, every cartoon that people like. <laughs> oh, that was it. <laughs> if it has a fandom, Rob has worked on it. Uh, Dexter's Lab, Big City Greens, Foster's Home, uh, Powerpuff Girls. Don't forget about Mean and the Count, my series of shorts. Mean and Count, yeah, Mean and the Count, yeah. Kid Cosmic. Yes! That must that must have been it. It's. Uh, I think it's the initials are GF. Is that Girlfriend? Was the show called Girlfriend? Oh, yeah. I think you were a supervising producer on the show Girlfriend. Was it, it was Lumberjack yeah. Girlfriend. <laughs> Lumberjack Girl. <laughs> Guys, it was gluten free. Oh, oh gluten free. Right. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. That was a healthy show. Um, yeah, so we previously interviewed you about the season two episode you directed, Scary Oak, mm-hmm. about the book you wrote, Dippers and Mabel's Guide to Mystery and Nonstop mm-hmm. Fun, and about another book you wrote, uh, Gravity Falls Journal 3. Uh, establishing a precedent that you write books sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I did. I for I forced I forced that forced that precedent onto the world. Yeah. So you you talked about um I had asked you during Journal Three if one of the goals in volunteering to work on on all these books for the shows you worked on and uh, otherwise such as Onward. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Was to establish yourself as an author. And the answer was yes, to make it make things quickly. The answer yeah. was yes. Let's not leave everybody in too much suspense. <laughs> that way you don't have to go back and listen to that episode, but you should, because it's a great episode. <laughs> no, I wanted them to backtrack to that episode. To find out what find the answer it. was. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pause and go return to the episode. <laughs> so um, you have just, like, literally just, like, last month as of this recording, yes. released your first original book. Yes. It's titled The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things. Two of us read it, one of us listened to it. Mm-hmm. Oh, let's see if you can figure out what it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I know Shelby, I, I sent it to Shelby, so I know Shelby read it. I think she did, unless she just threw the book aside and listened to the audiobook instead. Well, the problem was that something came out of it and kidnapped Shelby's uh-huh. sister. Yeah, it was a whole thing. I saw that video. I still need to post that one. I was waiting for this interview. Before oh, I can't wait to, for people to see it. It's great. <laughs> Ooh. Yes. No, yes. Uh, so, um, Charlie, maybe you listen to the audiobook since you are, uh, are you in Europe? Is that correct? Since we last did an episode of this podcast, I moved to Eastern Europe. So, yes, I listened to the audiobook. Uh, fa- fantastic book, Rob. First, let's just get that off the, the bat. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I received that copy from Shelby after Shelby was finished. They mailed it to me because we we're both uh, stateside. We're both in Mary Caw. Uh-huh. We saw the, the very sweet uh, inscription on the front page of said, uh, To the Mystery Shack Look Back crew, hope this gives you a little of that Gravity Falls feeling, Rob Renzetti. And, you know... I think I think we're going to have to wait till the end of this episode to find out if it does or not, but I have a suspicion <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> it had siblings and monsters. That checked off two of the boxes right there. Well, there, yeah. you, go. there you go. <laughs> but uh, how long has this been in the making, Rob? Yeah, how, how did this all come to be? I'm very, very curious. Um, it's been about five years in the making. Wow. Good golly. I think I look back on my um, first notes from it in there from... 2017. Okay. I started kind of t- jotting down notes in 2017, but I really started it re- writing it for real at the start of 2018. In fact, it was my New Year's resolution for 2018, which was 
I'm going to write a version of this book. Whether it ever sees the light of day or not, I don't know, but I'm going to try and write a real version of this book because it had been a goal of mine to write something original since I'd started writing all the books I did for Disney. Um, right. And, and honestly, before that, I'd have I had aspirations to write um, horror stories um, kind of for a while now. Um, and I'd written kind of half half-assed a few uh, short stories and just written versions of them, never submitted them anywhere, but just like kind of to get warmed up and were, see. Were, were they always like intended for the age range that, that this book is? Cause this is like, a, it's a middle grade sort of, uh, no, the, uh, the stories were more geared towards an adult audience. So none of them are so horrific that I don't think a kid could read them. Um, sure. there's only a few of them that actually got written and um, most of them are just like ideas jotted down on paper. Um, um, and I may return to those someday, but I just, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. after having the experience, having kind of written those on the side, just when I had an off, off minute or something like that, while I was working, you know, on Gravity Falls and, and stuff before that, when, when I got to write the actual Gravity Falls books that kind of geared me towards targeting the same kind of audience, the middle grid audience, because right. it's the audience I've been writing for my whole career, just been writing in cartoon form. Yeah. yeah. So I've. I feel like I have some idea of what that target is. <laughs> I listened to the audiobook with my wife, and one of her comments was, I didn't know that horror existed for the middle grade, but... um, I mean, like, Goosebumps was huge when we were. True. As you mentioned, you have been fascinated with horror since um, you decided to befriend Frankenstein as a youth. That's right. Yeah, did you read about that? Yeah. No, you, you told us about that on, uh, on the podcast. Oh, did I? Okay, I, I wrote an article about that for um, the school library journal recently, like a little guest post. That's amazing. <gasps> but yeah, it's been a recurring facet of your career, the first thing you got on on, on television was Mina and the Count, which was about Count Dracula. Yep. Um, I I know so many people who still to this day have nightmares about Raggedy Android. <laughs> oh yeah, you you can't stop with the rag dolls, huh? No, no, you know that's you another... got stopped one time. Well, sure. There was supposed to be a third one, right? The suit was going to come back. It was want, wanted to merge with Jenny permanently, and it was going to drown Brad if she didn't agree. Um, it was a very rough idea. It was just a one-page outline, and I don't even know where that only exists. Because horror has been such a facet of your career, and you felt comfortable writing it for a middle-grade audience, how many R-rated horror films did you watch at Zenith and Apogee's age? <laughs> uh, at their age, I wasn't watching too much. I, I, Like I told you before, I was a bit of a scaredy cat, and it took me a while to kind of transition into horror. But by the time I was a teenager... Um, which I guess Apogee is a teenager. By the time I would be fourteen, like Apogee, I was watching a lot of uh, a lot of horror movies and stuff, and and that just increased as I got older and older. And I'm, you know, I'm a huge horror fan now. I don't know if I'm, I might be misattributing this quote or this idea, but I think it might have been Don Bluth or someone who said something along the lines of like, kids can handle like, uh, like you, you can scare the shit out of kids. They'll, they're fine. Like. Yeah, like, it's it's good for them. And it's like, it I is. do I do I do see see what they're saying, you know. <laughs> I know that on Gravity Falls, you guys talked a lot about how you would pull from like Pinocchio and Dumbo, things that are like legitimately terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For kids yes. and is Disney like so when Disney gets on your back about it, you're like, this is you guys, like. <laughs> yeah, I mean Disney. I mean the current wave of Disney execs. There's some good ones, but the general vibe of the company is is a it's. None of these people realize the legacy that they're working for. They don't understand right, where, Disney, right. where Disney comes from or mm -hmm. what Disney really is. They just look at um, High School Musical and think that's the Disney brand. It's like, right. no, that's that's the bright, shiny part of Fast, the Disney brand. Yeah. Look over there in the corner. Look in the shadows and you'll find You'll like, find children turning into donkeys. Yeah, exactly. You'll find all the dark schlep that happened in the original features. This book certainly brings to mind Alice in Wonderland. Yes. It's going into a hole to a topsy-turvy world. Yep. I wanted to ask, what were some of your other influences for the, the, the story and the world of Grabog, if I'm if the audiobook is pronouncing it correctly? That is, Grabog is correct, yes. I, I made sure, right, cool. I hope everything's pronounced in the audiobook correctly. I haven't listened to it myself yet. I need to get a copy. Ah. Uh, before we joined the call, we discussed... They were like, oh, we don't know how to pronounce them, so we'll have to ask Rob. And I'm like, actually, I don't know how to spell them. <laughs> <laughs> With our powers combined, we can do it. Alice in Wonderland was a huge influence, obviously. Um, um, the bag itself is um, a couple of things. The less obvious one is that the, the title in itself actually comes from my wife. Um, oh, wow. Who... Um, has a great way with the turn of phrase. And the reason it's called the horrible bag of terrible things is we are pack rats and lots of paper piles accumulate and eventually mm. we'll try and clean up the house and do a good job. Sometimes we do a slapdash job and we just throw things into a bag. <laughs> 
And so there was a grocery bag full of old like phone receipts and credit card bills and all that. And it was something we didn't want to deal with. And it was shoved in the corner and Tracy called it the horrible bag of terrible things. <laughs> I, I love, love that. that so much. So I just love that and, and latched onto it, but it didn't really, it, there was really nothing behind it for a while. But um, the other influences, I was a huge fan of, um, uh, when I was a kid, they showed the 1960s Felix cartoons on a local yes. uh, station. And he's got this bag of tricks, um, which, you know, he, he pulls stuff out of, it transforms. It's really, I was just, I was in love with the bag of tricks. I loved that. And you were like, what if the bag of tricks was disgusting? Yeah, what if the bag of tricks was a disgusting? There was a, you went inside and there was a horrible world in there. Yeah. The design of the bag that you see on the cover of the book is kind of heavily influenced by Felix's bag of tricks. I did notice. And we kind of did a modern version of that on uh, Foster's with Coco and her eggs where she'd, you know, she'd, oh, yeah. she'd hatch an egg and yeah, weird right. stuff would come out of it. So On um, the note of, um, you know, kind of classic cartoon shout outs. And, and this is like my, this is later in the book, but it's very minor. So we can, we can cut it if you feel it's too spoilerish. But I, I did notice there's a theme of like cruelty to animals as musical instruments which is totally a thing that like mickey mouse would like pick up a cat and like yeah. pull on its tail and it would make music and i was like he is a menace feels like an homage like it, was, it wasn't a conscious homage but i find that like when people talk to me about my book there's things in it that i don't realize i'm pulling from consciously you know what i mean right, certainly, right. because this stuff is so much in my bloodstream and in my thought processes and it's so ingrained um yeah I don't necessarily have to go like, and now I'm going to do this. And then I realize later it's like kind of a reference or someone points it out to me and I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. You are what you eat applies to your media consumption. Exactly. Too. Yes. You are what you eat with your eyeballs and ears, too. For sure. Uh, but it never feels derivative. It, it just feels like it's it's another like part of this like pantheon of, of these types of, of fiction. You know, it feels like it's isekai. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's an isekai. Already feels like a classic in a way. Because well, thank you. Um, thank you. And very yeah, much. Of course, I was. My first thought when I was reading this was, okay, well, when's the animated uh, film coming? But then <laughs> my second thought was, no, when is the Jim Henson Creature Shop film oh, coming? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, my gosh. Yes. This has the Labyrinth vibes. I would love to. Um, I mean, I've obviously I've thought of it as, a, as some sort of um, film adaptation or, or miniseries adaptation. And, um, I mean, a Henson thing would be a dream come true. Yeah, I mean, puppets of these characters. I mean, I'd also be interested in Leica taking a pass at it or the people that did Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Like, oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I could see... I, my first thought would be that, like, when you're on Earth, it's a it's a it's a two D animation, and when you go to Gabag, it becomes stop motion. Um, oh, that's sim similar to uh, the live action stop motion of James and the Giant Peach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if, if those are the types of movies you like, like uh, Labyrinth, this book is absolutely for you. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, if you like books like Spiderwick Chronicles and like. Coraline, those are or just spiders in general. Spiders in yeah, general, yeah. yeah. Definitely, like, you're kind of serious. And if you don't listen to the end where we say all this, I just want a quick get out there. It's available wherever books are sold. There's an audiobook version on Audible that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, and uh, another big influence before we move on is um, uh, an unfortunate series of events was a, was a, was yep, a, big, exactly. a big influence on me. I love that was my favorite series growing up. Definitely a lot of the a lot of the pros when you come up with comparison for things kind of brings uh, has a lemony flavor. <laughs> so citrusy almost. Yeah, originally I was going to have a more ov uh, overt narrator character. Um, I'm very much influenced by that series, but it's um, and I kind of started writing the book that way, but it kind of fell out. The audiobook narrator who is a voice artist named Jay Myers definitely seems to go with that direction because he does not use his normal voice for the narrator. He puts on a, a British accent. Yeah, no, I, I always imagine, well, you know, uh, Tim Curry, I listened to audio versions of the unfortunate Absolutely. events. And Tim Curry did most of the ones. I was, he does an amazing job. Violet Baudelaire, the eldest, liked to skip rocks. Like most 14-year-olds, she was right-handed, so the rocks skipped farther across the murky water when Violet used her right hand than when she used her left. Uh, I didn't want to just use Tim Curry because I didn't want it to be such a direct uh, correlation. Sure. But then Apogee had turned 13, and in the year and a half since, she'd been thwarting his schemes instead of helping come up with them. 
And when she couldn't stop him, she would rat on him. This was one of the guys that was in the round of auditions that Penguin sent to me, and I just, he did such a great job with the narrator. He kind of nailed, with the characters that they used for the audition section of the book, he just was so much closer than anybody else. I was real pleased with him. His Kreeble, though. Mwah. Yeah, 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 Kreeble. I love I loved, uh, what he did with Kreeble. Here is a joke. What is always full and always empty, but never, wait, no, that is more of a riddle. Well, before we go further, maybe, Rob, do you want to give, like, you know, whatever level of synopsis that you are comfortable with just to sort of contextualize what we're about to talk oh, sure. about without giving sure, sure, sure. anything away? Yeah, we'll try and keep it as spoiler-free as possible. But basically, the setup of the book is there's a young uh, 11-year-old boy named Zenith Maelstrom. Does that mean the end of the storm? <laughs> a Maelstrom is a storm, so his last name just means storm. And his first name, uh, as well as Apogee's first name, mean, mean the conclusion? Climax, yeah. Well, it means peak, uh, or the high. Yeah, highest, the climax. Highest point or climax or, yeah. Zenith. So it's the eye of the storm. Kind of, yeah. He's a young boy who's been punished. He believes unfairly at the beginning of the summer. Um, so he's stuck in the house. His parents are away at work. His older sister, Apogee, is watching him, which he resents. And um, he hears something on the front porch. The story starts after he gra opens the door. I don't think anybody even knocks, but he senses that something's happened on the front porch. And he discovers this bag, which is this horrible looking bag because it's made of all these disparate animal skins and they're all sewn together with this ragged stitching. Um, it's just a bag full of menace and he cannot resist it because he is curious. And uh, he opens it, nothing seems to be inside, but then he pricks his finger on the bag. A little blood drops into the bag and that brings the bag to life. And this horrible creature, which is kind of half spider, or half, half hairball, crawls out escapes into the house and eventually kidnaps his older sister Apogee and drags her into the bag. And uh, Zenith discovers that the bag, there's a, there's somehow the bag is a portal to another dimension, to a world called Grabog, uh, which is full of other nasty things. And his sister has been kidnapped for some nefarious purpose, which is unclear at first. And he has to make his way through this world, try to find where his sister is and save her before she is um, put to death or maybe perhaps something worse than death happens to her. Some other terrible thing in the horrible bag. Yes, one of the terrible things. A series of unfortunate events, if you will. It is a series of unfortunate events, for sure. I mean, yeah, it's spectacular. And I love, so Apogee and, and Zenith, as you said, are both actual words, um, not names so much, but they both mean, you know, the climax or the peak of something. Um, so the names mean the same thing, but I notice, like, you know, Zenith, feels undervalued and looked down on and he's at the end of the alphabet and he sees his sister as all high and mighty she's at the beginning of the alphabet so it almost reflects like you know he, he doesn't think that they are on equal terms even though their names mean the same thing so they actually have more in common than he probably thinks but there's that that sibling dynamic where he doesn't see it that way part of his hang up with his sister is that they used to be much closer um a couple of years back you know they used to be thick thieves as apogee would oh, put it yeah she has a problem with getting phrases correct yeah that changed when his sister became a teenager and he doesn't understand why they've kind of grown apart and he's kind of resentful of it I don't remember if this came up uh, when we're talking about Gravity Falls, but do you have siblings? Like, is this a, a, a grounded thing? It, it feels like this is written from some experience, and siblings have also obviously cropped up in a lot of your career. Uh, Dee Dee and Dexter, Brad and Tuck, yeah. Dipper and Mabel. It's weird because my own experience is that I had two much older brothers. Um, I was a result of my mother's second marriage, and I had two brothers that were literally were my half-brothers, but I never thought of them as that. Um, and they were seven and 11 years older than me. So I basically had other adults in the house, which is what Zenith now feels like Apogee's mm, become. It's like he's yeah. got another parent because instead of getting, you know, partnering him uh, with him on all his schemes, she's basically calling him out, ratting him out, um, telling his parents Zenith is misbehaving. And he doesn't understand why that's happening. It's a very sort of kids next door view where once you hit a certain age, you are now an adult, you're on their side, you're not on the kid's side anymore. Right. You know, there's a division, there's like a dividing line. And once you cross it, you know, it can't be like how it was. Or can it? Or can it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we shall see. There's a great theme that I love of like, again, not to give too much away, but of just like responsibility and sibling responsibility. And like, like you said, like, how much do you take on the role of another parent and how much do you like be by their side as a sibling? And also just when you as the younger person in the family are concerned for an older person in your family and how that is not necessarily how it is quote unquote supposed to be where it's like you are the one 
being looked out for, but also you want to look out for the other people. I mean, Zenith is put in the uncomfortable position of getting his sister into trouble and therefore having to get her out of it. And um, yeah. Apogee is not necessarily willing or wanting to take help from him. Right. Um, because she can't abandon her role as the older sibling and the protector of him. Right. Even when she's the one who's in more danger. Whereas it's something that we never really saw on Gravity Falls because they are twins and like Mabel is only five minutes older than Dipper. So they were kind of always saving each other and, um, you know, on, on equal terms in that sense. But uh, when my wife and I started the book, she said, is it weird I'm picturing Dexter and Dee Dee? <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose it is, but, uh, you know, the, all these things are influences. Dexter is obviously, not a lot of people know that, but Dexter and Dee Dee's relationship is kind of modeled on my relationship with Gendy's girlfriend at the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so Dexter is just you because because it's also based on the voice you did for your answering machine when you were roommates. I was the first voice of Dexter and yeah, I mean Oh wow. I um, eventually I came to uh, reconcile with his girlfriend Lori and I, she's actually a, a lovely she was a lovely woman at the time. I was She just... was always uh, poking around your room asking what various buttons do. <laughs> <laughs> nah, exactly. No, she was a very bright, cheery young woman who Gendy hooked up with when we were at CalArts. And they dated for a few years, both at CalArts and afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I was jealous. I was resentful that this this girl had come and taken my best friend away because Gendy and I were thick, thick thieves back yeah. then. And all of a sudden you were spending all this time over at her place and I was abandoned and I felt it. Mm. And uh, so I was, uh, I did not like her and I was very, very, uh, um, yeah. This is another tidbit that I don't know. I think I might've talked about this once or twice before, but there's an episode that has a photo of Dee Dee and Dexter where Dexter is recoiling as Dee Dee sticks her tongue out with food on it. Mm-hmm. And that is actually based on a photo of me and Lori. Um, <laughs> from- <laughs> From Cal Arts, That's amazing. Where I'm just looking at her with total disdain as she's laughing wow. with her mouth full of food. That's amazing. Are you an inventor then? No. <laughs> I have no scientific ability whatsoever. Because I noticed uh, technological inspiration and intuitiveness is also an aspect of Zenith's character. Sure. I do. That's that's all myth. I have no technological ability. Like, it took me a good 30 years to know, learn how to wield a hammer correctly. Correctly. Um, I'm, I hated science in school. Uh, he does do a chemistry experiment before the first book begins. That, that's what lands him in trouble. His spring semester had ended with a literal bang when Zenith's enthusiasm for chemistry had inspired a kitchen experiment with explosive results. Zenith argued that his extracurricular project displayed initiative and intellectual curiosity, admirable traits that should be encouraged, if not rewarded. Uh, I was curious about how the process of making an original book compared to the process of doing the the Gravity Falls books and the the quests of your uh, onward book for Disney as far as basing it on existing characters and worlds versus uh, creating yours whole cloth, and in this case, multiple different cloths all ah. stitched together in a horrible bag. Um, well, I mean, obviously, the, the influences are much more direct when you're working with an existing property. You know, in the Gravity Falls books, we had the characters. In Journal 3, we had some of the pages. Um, for the DuckTales book and the Onward book, I was referencing and kind of retelling the stories that were already done um, and just adding to them and, and taking things from a different angle and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, in terms of yeah. coming up with stuff, it just was kind of like what came into my head and what part of it, like what I said with the horrible bag, the first thing I had was the title. Um, and I really didn't know what the title meant for a while. And then I figured out that there was something inside of it and that there was going to be an adventure inside of the book. And um, from there, I kind of just kind of extrapolated forward and kind of it's a lot of thought experiments and just writing down ideas and writing them down with no order or no no ranking or no primacy or whatever. I, I like to use question marks at the end of everything right. because it makes it feel like it's not necessary and that if I write something stupid down, it's okay because I may not end up using that stupid idea yeah not not set in stone uh, nothing set in stone <laughs> and everything's everything's up for grabs so i and i do that as i'm writing through the book as well like a bunch i'm kind of a uh, there's always this thing in writing where you're are you a pantser or a plotter and i'm mostly a plotter um you know i don't i don't like just start at the beginning and wonder where the book's gonna go like i knew 
what the whole plot of the first book was before I wrote it. Yeah. But as I go along, I don't know all the details. And that's where kind of like inspiration and intuition takes you. And Mm -hmm. as I'm writing the book, I do do kind of write it from front to back for the most part, at least the first time through. And as I'm going, as new things occur to me, I throw notes in ahead of the stuff that's actually written out and just like write new questions in in there or or when I come up with something, but I know how it's written. I just write the idea in there. So like, this is where you're heading right now. Yeah. This is where this is. Yeah, that makes sense. You, you, You just kind of go in a straight line first and then when you're done you can go back and weave set up and pay off and and, and things once in. i knew that i'm going to go to an alternate world there's like then the you know there's influences like alice in wonderland and stuff that comes into it like, yeah you know those kind of things all of a sudden that's a touchstone for me yeah in the second book which is going to be out next year um called Ooh. the the twisted tower of endless torment is the title of that book okay is that another tracyism no that the well, she did come up with part of that she's the one who came up with twisted um, there's a tower that's called Eternity Tower, which um, factors into the book. And uh, we were trying to come up with a title for the second book, and she's the one who came up with Twisted for the adjective in front of Tower, which I liked quite a bit. Were you always wanting to do sequel? Was this ever going to be a standalone book? When I first thought of it, I thought of it as one book. Um, but the ending always lent itself to more books. And my literary agent asked me very early in the process, like, do you see this as one book or three? Mm-hmm. And I said, I think it could be a trilogy. And he said, so when we go out, in, in addition to the first book, I want you to write a, a page for what the second book would be in a paragraph of what the third book would be. Gotcha. So they could see the whole trilogy. So yeah. um, at that point, it was a trilogy. I don't honestly remember how the first book might have ended where I thought it would just be the end. The way the first book ends was, from a very early standpoint, was where I was heading. So yeah. I knew I wanted the adventure to continue because the adventure is kind of, it ends, but it doesn't. And um, I knew there were at least two more stories uh, left to tell. So the second book, I just saw the second book in PDF form which is where it first starts to look like its final version. Pretty darn um, fine. It's... That's what I always say. PDF. <laughs> and uh, I just did my last big changes on that, and I'm starting to write the third book now. Can't wait. On your note of, like, question marks in your own notes, and again, yeah, this is a thing we observed in Gravity Falls as well, but, like, leaving questions that even the characters aren't really sure what the answers are, and, and, then, and then it leaves the readers kind of wondering about it, too, and especially for something supernatural and, and mysterious. It's nice to to not close every door, um, even if you don't have a sequel plan. For sure. It's just, it's going to be really interesting to see how you raise the stakes because like it feels like where it ends is at a pretty like high stake. And so it's just going to be really interesting to see the zenith of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Or perchance the apogee. Those who have seen the second book have said they didn't see where it was going. Um, so I hope you will all be surprised by what happens. Um, okay. Good. Right. The thing I was getting towards with Alice in Wonderland without blowing anything is there's a courtroom scene in the second book, which is one of my favorite oh my parts gosh. of the book. I really, and that was very, <gasps> okay. very much influ- influenced by the, you know, Alice on trial. I mean, it's an, it's an inherently interesting concept of like, we think of the courts as such a l- rigid logical thing and then put that in a world that does not make any sense. And, uh, you know. Also happened in Gravity Falls. That's true. Yeah. Yes, it did. Judge Kitty Kitty Meow Meow Face Schwartzstein. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, sh- that judge will not be presiding. No, nah, oh, well, he doesn't have jurisdiction in in Grabog. He does. It'll be John Stewart out of character. <laughs> yeah, he he, li- he turns out he lives in Grabog. <laughs> He's from Grabog. Yeah, <laughs> actually, John Stewart could do a pretty good job. The one who's in charge is the Inquisitor, who is very br- briefly mentioned in Book One. That's right. Um, yes, yeah. so I, I was. That was. I was wondering if that of like. Oh yeah, I wonder. There are a few things that I seeded in book one that actually come to fruition in book two. Um, yeah. That kind of ties in with a question of mine. Certainly a staple of the Alice in Wonderland, Wizard of Oz type book is they meet this character, then they meet this character, which gave you uh, a lot of th- freedom to just put in the weirdest malarkey you could come <laughs> up with. Um, tell us about some of those characters they meet and, and and what it was like writing them and if there were any particular inspirations or, or things you had in mind. I know certainly what I would guess is your favorite amongst them is Creeble. Yeah, Creeble is my favorite character. She's a gargoyle who Zenith meets relatively early in his adventures and she's um, knowledgeable. She understands um, English as English was called in Gervog because it comes originally from Angoland. She's wise. Of uh, She knows all about Gervog. 
Um, she frustratingly literal though. She's frustratingly literal. She does understand English, but she doesn't understand metaphor or simile. So, any, so sort of an accuracy over tact for sure, which is a problem of mine, definitely. But I, un- unlike Creeble, I love to use old time crazy phrases um, that are way out of date. <laughs> we most, do know this. <laughs> most most people don't understand today. Um, so. Uh, Creeble is kind of my way of um, poking fun at myself and also uh, having a character that's the direct opposite of me who who never uses a metaphorical phrase and doesn't understand what, what you're talking about when you use one. So and I, I assume you don't eat grits. I was about to say, you don't you don't partake. I do not. Um, you know, I've got my own disgusting habits, but they won't be discussed here. But yeah, Creeble, <laughs> gargoyles in Grabag enjoy earwax, which they call grits. So <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't that great? <laughs> That's the proper reaction, Charlie. <laughs> I always want a little bit of gross out humor for because I think kid, middle grade kids love that kind of stuff. And I know. I, mean, I think that's also that's part of the <laughs> horror because there's yes. like even getting into the bag is like pricking your finger you have to like bleed into the bag for it to open yes and there are three characters that act as like the gatekeepers they're kind of inspired by the the witches from Macbeth. Ah, gotcha yeah zenith calls them the foul mouths once he gets into the bag the bag all of a sudden gets larger illogically so that he's kind of in like this cave slash chapel sized space which is the bag enlarged and the seam that's running down the bottom of the bag has three gaps in it, and those gaps speak to him. They are living creatures, and they liked the taste of the drop of blood that he dropped into the bag. In fact, must be blood. They want more blood from him in order to let him pass, and uh, I will leave it to the reader to figure out how he gets past them without giving them his blood. But <laughs> Disney BSNP would have hated that. <laughs> it's jam. I mean, yeah, that's the freedom of writing a book. Uh, there's lots of things that I was able to get away with that broadcast standards and practices probably wouldn't let go. But yeah, there's a lot of soft body horror. Like everybody that Zenith meets in the first book wants some part of him, some physical part of him. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that. Yeah, it's, it is a connecting theme. The Mouths wants uh, his blood. Creeble wants his ear grits. Albert also wants a part of him. Albert, I think Albert might be my favorite character. And again, without giving too much away. Um... Yeah, yeah, no, there's another raggedy character in the horrible bag called Raggedy Albert who is a living a ragdoll, a foot tall living ragdoll. Suffice it to say, Raggedy Albert wants uh, Zenith to become his friend, and uh, but his definition of friendship is uh, is not um, so friendly, let's so say. When that character speaks, uh, you Gravity Falls fans out there, it activated my sleeper agent, um, <laughs> cy- Cypher Brain, but it was like, I didn't even have to decode it. I could, like, read it. That's how Gravity Falls brained I am. Good for like, you. I could just... <laughs> Oh, I missed that it. in the audiobook. Yeah, he's just, unfortunately, he just mumbles nonsense in the audiobook. There's no way to translate. With his mouth undone, Albert spoke in a much calmer manner, but the noises he made were still incomprehensible to Zenith. But Creeble is there to helpfully translate for Zenith and the reader. Left his scissors at home, Creeble explained. What cipher was it? Uh, well, I guess I won't give it away for you Gravity Falls uh, fans if we're going to pick up this book. It's one of the easier codes. It's not meant to be too tough. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's simple enough that I think it was. it's recognizable on site as one of the ciphers. And I think anybody who's not familiar can figure it out pretty quickly. I mean, was that you kind of... Uh... Like shouting that out. Yes, or, that was or meant to of... be a nod to all the Gravity Falls fans because I'm yeah. I'm not big into codes. Uh, Hirsch introduced me to all this code stuff. What is your obsession with scary ragdolls? You know that <laughs> uh, that goes back to my childhood as well. Like one of the few things in my childhood house that was from my mother's childhood was two of the old Raggedy Ann and Andy books. She had like two of the books that were printed in the 1930s. She was born in 32. And she had gotten these books from her grandma or her parents or stuff. Um, and so they were her childhood books and they were out like in the bottom of this like side table to this couch that we had in the front room. And every once in a while I would just look at them and I was just fascinated by the art style. And I thought Raggedy Ann and Andy were both very appealing and very creepy. Yeah, I think in a film adaptation, Albert should be 2D animated on ones like it's Richard Williams doing the uh, <laughs> the Raggedy Ann movie. Um, yeah. Which uh, gave a lot of people nightmares as well, talking about Pinocchio and Raggedy Android. 
And also, I recently discovered that there's an old Fleischer uh, short. They did a sh one short with Raggedy Ann and Andy as well. Huh. And they did very, very faithfully um, translated into um, into animation, um, just like the Richard Williams. I do love that the code is in there, because like what we praised about Dippers and Mabel's Guide, um, it inducts kids into that world of like decoding of like it, it's not really spelling it out for you but if you notice that it's there and you decode it it's like oh that is that phrase in a code and then yeah. it's it's you're along for the ride you're along you feel like you're an active like participant in in zenith's uh adventure and i i, I think that's awesome i really like the way you turn the raggedy idea even more twisted than it already was. So yeah. it's like when you go back and read it, it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. That, yeah, that yeah. would be something we don't want to talk about. But yeah, there is a twist to things. No, yeah, no, not, no, no, not no. Too much Just a little taste of like, yeah. once you go back, you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you know, because everything's in a bag, I, the, you know, drawing on like tailoring and costuming and all that kind of stuff was a big, yeah, a big yeah, influence, yeah. especially in the first book. It's, there's less of that in the second book. I'm glad you got those thoughts out of your head because I be really scared for you if you had to keep them in, in <laughs> your head without without getting them out somehow without exercising them it's good therapy he could use the memory gun <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but true. uh my personal favorites were the bird brothers oh yeah mm -hmm. you and muncie yeah i like them a lot too um and I didn't understand what I was going to do with Hugh until I got to that part of the book. Yeah. Loyalties shift a lot in the book and um, his loyalties shift in a way that delighted yeah. me that I didn't really understand until I got there. Um, I said while listening to it with my wife that when this gets a fandom, the sexy artwork is all going to be of Hugh. <laughs> <laughs> Tumblr sexy man Hugh. Really? Okay. I didn't I have I would... well you gotta hear it with the voice that, that okay, the narrator yeah, gives yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Because he, he gives Muncie this kind of Gandalf impression that's a little Richard Nixon-y. Slow down and hold on. Slow down and hold on. And then he does this kind of um more swashbuckling. Yeah. More swashbuckler more sort okay, of yeah. voice for yeah. A pleasure to meet you. He bowed his head. I am the seeker of Grabarg, collector of knowledge. But everybody calls me Hugh. The bird lifted his head, tilted it at Zenith, and waited. Don't be rude, Furman. Introduce yourself. Gotcha. Yeah, again, I've only heard snippets of these characters, just a little bit, so I'm looking forward to listening to the audiobook version myself. I have to actually reach out to the audiobook people. I've had it on hold on Libby, um, the, the library app. Um, but it's not available yet. I'm just waiting for it to show up so I can. You're like, you're like, don't you know who I am? <laughs> yeah, shouldn't I be first? <laughs> yeah. Now knowing how influenced by a series of unfortunate events audiobooks, like I'm gonna need to listen to it because that Tim Curry reading was my everything. The direction I gave for my narrator was basically like he is very closely aligned with Zenith because he's in his thoughts, but he's also enjoying the torture that Zenith is going under a little bit as well. <laughs> All Zenith's friends were laughing. Even Apogee was laughing. I picture you as like the Bugs Bunny making the cartoon and Zenith as the, the Daffy Duck. For sure. Like, being put through all of this, <laughs> all sure. of this torment. And you're just like, ain't I a stinker? You have to love your characters, and but also be willing to make them suffer. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. That's how they earn a, a happy ending. I mean, yes, that's, that's exactly. the whole idea. And um, to go back to your initial inscription on the book page for us of giving that Gravity Falls feeling, it absolutely succeed like without a doubt like if you are a fan of gravity falls at all in any stretch you will guaranteed love this book and it scratches that itch so much that i'm already like kind of theory crafting without even realizing it and there's things that i, I don't really want to get into because it would be spoilers but i so like i'm getting i'm building a new wing of the hall of conspiracies just for the, hor the horrible <laughs> bag i mean i guess to hint at it without giving anything away of like what i was thinking about anytime there is as charlie put it earlier like in an isekai sort of way anytime there's a parallel dimension of reality to earth with humans like i'm always curious of are the denizens of this reality you know to what extent are they aware of humans and earth and uh, if we on our side are not really aware of this world what do they know about us and then what does that mean about them? I'm always looking for those little nuggets. Or, or grits, if you will. I think, uh, <laughs> I think, there's, I think there's plenty of, of grits for, for people who uh, are, are interested in, in theorizing about that kind of thing. Oh, I will leave you to your theories. Thank you. Thank you. I, I enjoy them. I enjoy them quite a bit. And I think they enjoyed this book. And uh, there's just so much visceral stuff where I was like, like reading it, I was like, 
you know, if I were <laughs> saying it like if I were a kid reading this, I would be very scared. But then I'm also an adult reading this and I am very scared. So <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Maybe I just scare easily or maybe it's it's really effective uh, horror at any age. I think this would have been formative to me if I had read this as a kid, because like, as I said, Spiderwick and a series of unfortunate events were my favorite mm-hmm. books. This would have fit right in. It's formative to me right now. My brain's not done developing yet. It can still be formative. <laughs> oh, mine's too old now. I'm just like... Shelby's brain is rotting. <laughs> my brain is <laughs> rotting as we speak. Oh no, poor Shelby. I'm sorry. In the bag. Yeah, into the bag with me. Yeah, put it in the bag. Is there receipt paper in the in the horrible bag? <laughs> like in the real maybe, life horrible maybe bag? Maybe in or... a corner. I don't know. That's the final boss in the third book. Don't spoil it, Ella. <laughs> Does the horrible bag in real life still exist? Uh, no, I don't. I think we disposed of that bag. Uh, a while back. It's had its uh, offspring, believe me. I don't yeah, know. There true. might be one on the way to you oh. as soon as I finish sewing it. That would be lovely. How many creatures did you skin? Ah, uh, just the one. How many, how many different types of skin did it have? So this is a cosplay bag. So like I had to dye it a whole bunch of different colors. I haven't heard anything of this video you sent. Rob, yeah, I didn't know about that about either. That? It's just like a just like a little 30 second video. Me getting pulled into a bag of horrible things by a little guy. Any any praise that people have said about Gravity Falls or any of these other sort of things in this genre, I think could be applied to this and more. I mean Very especially if you liked the, the ghost pages of Journal 3, because Rob oh, wrote yeah, all of those yeah, and it's got a bunch of fun little horror knots for the kids. Yeah. Thank you. I even threw in a talking robot for the kids. Yeah, no, there's no, <laughs> unfortunately, there's no robots. I had a robot character. Although, uh, speaking of speaking of talking robots, robots for, for the, the kids, kids yes. uh, your best known original creation, likely, is experiencing an anniversary at the moment, yeah? It is, yeah. It's the 20th anniversary of uh, the premiere of My Life as a Teenage Robot. That's and amazing. To celebrate, I am writing a new story, um, teenage robot story, uh, through my newsletter. Uh, I'm releasing it through my newsletter in chapters. It's a little bit of a serialized story with Jenny and everybody else from Teenage Robot. And if you go to my website, robbrunzetti.com, and you go to the newsletter page and you sign up, you will get to read a new uh, Teenage Robot story. And we did just read it. Ah. We did. Uh. Mm-hmm. Yep. Read the first uh, three chapters. Ah, well, very good. Thank you. I'm glad I'm glad to hear you guys. Are and it feels, you know, it, it feels like like you know, like I never left the show. The time hasn't passed. Well, yeah. I'm glad, thank you. I'm, I, I hope so. It's it was a little bit uh, it's daunting to come back to these characters after so long of a break. I imagine, yeah, the legacy that they have. I love all of the little turns of phrase with Mother Earth and the Earth Sun. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I kind of know where I'm going with that. I know how the first story will end. Um, but uh, getting there is a full of surprises as well. Actually, the story is kind of expanding as I write it in terms of the number of chapters I think there's going to be. Um, so That's awesome. If you sign up late, you can always link back to the earlier chapters. There's a link at the top of the new chapter to, to read the previous. All of them out thus far will be in the newsletter archive. Yes. And on the about section of your site, I noticed... At the very bottom, you have a link to this very podcast. I oh, that's right. Yeah, talking about the journal. Yeah. That was, uh, made me really happy to see. Well, I love talking with you guys about the Gravity Falls stuff. I've always felt that you're kind of a fourth curator. Like, Oh, mm-hmm. that's very kind of you. You did show up a lot. You did the Patreon shout outs with me. You are like the last bit of dialogue in the last uh, proper episode of, of the podcast. That's true. Right? <laughs> yes. Uh, the thing saying it's a living. Is, <laughs> yeah. Is that was fun. Very li- um. uh, and <laughs> you have done so much for this podcast, retweeting every single episode and and helping us badger yeah, <laughs> potential so prospective guests. It's only, it's only right that we help you, uh, you know, get the word out about this awesome original novel. And once you finish uh, buying and reading The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things, you can log on to the newsletter and read about the further adventures of Jenny the Teenage Robot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for having me so many times and talking with me about so many things. It's been a pleasure every time, and I've, I've certainly enjoyed so many horrible things. So many horrible things. <laughs> Ter- horrible and terrible horrible things. Horrible bags, terrible things. Yeah. Uh, I thank you for coming back and doing this special episode of a uh, of a uh, yeah. Uh, you know, on a, on a, on a subject that has. You know, it is very tangentially connected to Gravity Falls. Oh, we've but... done even, we've done more tangential topics on this podcast before. Oh, it's it's honestly pretty related. Well, good. Well, then I'm glad I'm glad uh, to be talking to you guys again. And the Gravity Falls fans gotta know the the people who 
enjoy the reveal of three separate journals or enjoy the design of the FBI's card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Journal three. That 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 creator is out there and doing something amazing and original. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I hope that fans of Gravity Falls will find this book because I think they will enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, especially in an age where, like, most, you know, fiction aimed at, at young kids, like, I feel like there's not much of this now um, of this type of thing, you it's know? It's all about YA these days. Uh, yeah, no, I felt like it feels, it feels, it feels like it feel it fills a niche that, uh, you know, is underserved. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I want kids to have something scary to read this Halloween. Oh, so. yeah, that's true. I didn't even think about yeah. spooky season. Yeah. No, that's a, you know, they, they bring them, they're bringing them out in summer to kind of get them revved up and warmed up and make people aware. And then like, you know, the, the it makes sense. enough yeah. people have got it. They're seeing it in their bookstore and thinking like, this sounds, this is good for Halloween. I'm going to buy like a hundred copies. And then on Halloween, when trick or treaters come and be like, I don't have candy, <laughs> but I have something even better. Some would say. Wow. And uh, as Rob said, Halloween. Halloween is coming up, so we will be releasing uh, the last three episodes of Garden Wall Recall. They have been recorded for a year, but I moved across the world. Yeah, we just got busy with life. <laughs> but uh, I edited this podcast. Um, you can hire me to edit other podcasts. Uh, <laughs> yeah! Email me at voice at charliemarlow.com. That's uh, voices in mouth sounds. And that's Charlie, C-H-A-R-L-E-Y-M-A-R-L-O-W-E, even seven, seven letters. You can find our other discussions with Rob and our entire coverage of Gravity Falls. We covered the whole dang thing. We covered all of gluten-free. Sometimes, sometimes I remember, because when we started the podcast, I was like, it, we're never going to be able to say Bill Cipher. Like, this is going to take forever <laughs> take to even forever. be alive. And now yeah. I, I think about the fact that... I'm, we did that. We did all fifty-two episodes in a year, and I'm like, "How did how did we manage?" That? Yeah, I <laughs> could I couldn't do it twice. No, <laughs> but good we news don't is we have don't have to, to. Uh, because it is all available at pipedreampodcasts.com. It's uh, dot as, com, as well as other podcasts that we're also on, like Pod Made You Special. And uh, I'm going to be on an upcoming episode of Escape from Vault Disney. Oh, cool. We might do a, a listener mail episode at some point after oh, yeah. we uh, finish releasing the Garden Wall Recall. So if you have anything you would like to say to us about Gravity Falls, Over the Garden Wall, Horrible Bag of Terrible Things, Phantom of the Paradise. Yes, please. Or just, I don't know, your day. We got a lot of emails that we're sitting on now for for the episode, um, but we also, you know, welcome any new ones at mysteryshacklookback at gmail.com. Um, so I've got a website, shelbysessler.com. It's got all of my VO, some of my costume work on it. Um, my awful... X. I hate X. I hate that they've changed the name to X. My, Don't uh, use it. Just go. Just say Twitter. Everybody knows it's Twitter. My my horrible X. The horrible X of terrible Musk. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. 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 Um, my uh, my Twitter is Shelby Sessler. My Instagram is Shelby Sessler. My TikTok is Shelby Sessler. My YouTube is Shelbini Vo. So that's where you can find some of my work. Love collaborating with some of my favorite people on here. So you can find stuff that I do pretty frequently. <laughs> yeah, and you can find uh, my ex still misses me, but a Rame is getting better. <laughs> Rame is getting Twitter. <laughs> yeah, my Twitter and uh, Instagram are at Drawn Without Ref. You can find my art and my other all the other things I've been doing lately other than visual art and animation. Uh, you can find... Some of the uh, music that I do at lhsery.bandcamp.com. Thank you, uh, Kyle Carosa, for that cadence. My website is uh, lhsery.weebly.com. That's E-L-L-A-C-E-S-A-R-I dot W-E-E-B-L-Y uh, dot com. It's dot com. Um, you can also check out my latest podcasting venture, that being The Matrix Reclamations, which I'm doing with good friend Hope Lickner of uh, High on Cartoons, a.k.a. Duck Takes. Uh, on that podcast, we're basically going through any topic at all related to the Matrix franchise, uh, bringing it back to its transgender roots. You can check it out on Zencaster or anywhere you get your podcasts and find it on the socials at Matrix Queer Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Also, uh, your curators recently collaborated on a project on my channel that I am immensely proud of. It is called uh, Well Abridge Me Princess. 
It is an abridged series of the old Zelda cartoon, but I don't really care what happens to the old Zelda cartoon, so it's sort of just me saying, what, what, what would I do if I had an adult swim show? Uh, Ella and I write a lot of it. Uh, Shelby and I voice a lot of it. I think if you like our sense of humor, you would enjoy it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed what I saw. Thank you. <laughs> we also have a, we do have a merch store. At, I believe it's Mystery Shack Look Back. Dot crowdmade.com I don't crowdmade.com slash mystery shack look one of those one of those things just look up crowdmade mystery shack look back and you'll find shirts and things with our faces on them cartoon faces my big thing is rob um there's links to my twitter which is just at rob and my instagram which i never have memorized which is mostly my name but with a weird dash in the middle of it or something i don't know i'm not on instagram yeah. nearly as much yeah. as i'm on twitter i'm on twitter all the time um, but yeah, Ella, you got a song to play us out? I mean, I will, but those, Charlie, those are added in, in post, you see. No, I'm trying to fabricate an illusion. The listeners don't have to know about that. Well, you know so... what? Welcome to the real world, listeners. It's time to shatter your illusions, your preconceptions. This is all fake. Podcasts aren't real. <laughs> We're kind of all puppets. Someone's controlling, I think. I've been pulled through that horrible bag where there's gargoyles and big dolls of rags. I've seen terrible things that all zigzag. What an awful twist that my sister's lost in grub bog. Ah, there you are, Hugh. Have you found any new details for me to record? As a matter of fact, brother, I've acquired the names of several contributors to something called a Patron. How peculiar. Now, let us list them so the scribe may increase the knowledge of the collectory. Uh, uh, I'll begin. Tiff Sykes. Hope. Sterling Jubilation Axel. Spencer Neil Campbell. Easy Snake Oven. Samantha Angley. Rich Roll. Calmer. Jesse Marie McDougall. May. Delphine Dussy. Adam with two A's, a D, and an M. Roe Davis. Vanillin Zucker. Mumbleteen D. Umbleteen. Elizabeth Newenfelt. Jamie Belt. Richard Scanlon. Joseph Jones. Elizabeth Clark. Oliver Plum. Junior Bra. Juno Series. Gwen Prime. Daddy Driftwood. P.D. Piranha Plant. Stephen Patrick Mulholland. Hugh Salinas. David Gansel. Fun Boringness. Friendly Local Geek. And Ryan Faber. Indeed, a worthy addition to Grabarg's knowledge. Oh, and I found one more thing. Any Furmans interested in having their name added to the Collectory should pledge their undying loyalty to the Patron at patreon.com slash mystery shack.